So now let's go to the injections room. So hello, Frank. Who are you? <laughs> hello, Benjamin. Hello, Marina. Oh, Thank I can you. see that you have a tremendous cask. Uh, so uh, <laughs> now uh, we are on the Star Wars vision about uh, the injections. So that's the, the new profile of Frank. C can you see the arteries with this tool? Yes, <laughs> and you are going to explain me why you are going to make an operation <laughs> with your injection. So please, now it's your turn. So let me just uh, say that we are very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Frank Rosengos one more time uh, with a fascial plastic surgeon from Mexico and a big expert from all over the world. And now he will focus, as it is, of course, the main topic now, uh, con concerning the coming uh, seconds and minutes uh, on, on the same vision that we have from uh, the anatomy now on the live patient. Thank you, Frank. So good morning, Paris. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Marina. And Dr. Castemon, a brilliant demonstration, I agree. And today, um, hello also. Good afternoon, Asia, by the way. My name is Dr. Rosenhaus, and with me we have Edith. Edith is a beautiful and kind patient of today, and the idea is to assess the vascular structure as we see the patients every day in our offices. And to do that, I will use, first of all, a very nice tool, which is topographic anatomy. And topographic anatomy means only that I'm going to locate surface landmarks that will provide me with some indication about the course and location of deeper anatomical structures. And the first area I'm going to deal with is the glabella. It's called a dangerous zone. It's considered one of that. And here we normally inject either toxin and fillers. And you have to know that every time that we contract a muscle over a fixed structure like a vessel or a nerve, we develop a line or a crease or a wrinkle. And she cannot uh, frown now because she had <laughs> a little bit of botulinum on toxin uh, on December, in December. But it doesn't matter because her furrows and her wrinkles on the glabella are very well seen and very well located when I push. So the first crease that I see, the most middle one, that one it's indicative of the last branch of the ophthalmic artery, the supratrochlear artery will come from here. And then it will go up and arborize all around the forehead, like this. Then I will go and I will look for the supraorbital crease. And in her case, if you look and not see it, especially in Asia, because they don't have any wrinkles, I'm so jealous of them, you can palpate the orbital rim and look for a supraorbital notch. And once, once you find it, you will see that this crease is responsible because it marks the way of that supraorbital artery and again, some arborization at the end. So once you do this and you have most of the arterial, arterial vasculature of the forehead, I will go to the face. And in the face, where is the facial artery? So I know where it starts. That means that the, it starts from the external carotid artery, and it goes over the border of the mandible, exactly in front of the masseter muscle, 0.5 centimeters. So ask the patient to bite. Bite, if you can bite. Thank you. And if you palpate, you will feel the pulse. And now I know that this is the beginning of the facial artery. Then I don't know exactly the course of it and the path, but I know where it ends. And it will end here in the piriform fossa. Now, we do have some variations, as Dr. Castemon said. And we know this because of studies done in South Korea by Dr. Kim and Dr. Moon. And the artery could be either medial to the nasolabial fold, on the nasolabial fold, lateral or more lateral. In Asian patients, the probabil probability of any of these is around the same, 25%. But in Caucasian patients, 
we're almost sure it's more lateral than medial in most of the cases. And you can help yourself again with some digital compression to know exactly where is the artery. So in this case, the artery will end here. Now, the trajectory of it is very irregular. It's serpentine and sinuous. It goes more or less, will go like this because it has to give some laxity for movement. And on their way, this art uh, facial artery will give some branches, the inferior labial and the superior labial, like that. Now, let's go back to the piriform fossa. Can we see there? Okay. So, right there, the artery is going to change directions. It will go upward. And since it's going to make an acute angle here, then it's not longer called the arterial okay. facial artery. The, the facial artery is called the angular artery. And it will go up exactly on the border of two anatomy units, the nose and the mid cheek. So it will start going up here, and after that it will give its first branch. Very important if you're going to do the noses, because this is the lateral nasal branch, and I know where it is because it always is uh, on the ailer groove. I can push, I can push, and see that this artery the, will be in the ailer groove. It will continue to the tip of the nose. It will give a little artery here on the mid ailer crease, but it will continue like that. And where are we going to take the angular artery? Again, we have several variations, but it might finish in a dead end, but in most of the cases, in most of them, we see that the angular artery comes up, and then, like Dr. Castemont said, there is a branch of the supratrochlear called the dorsal nasal artery, and this artery goes down and anastomosis with the angular. And there we go, here we are with the area that is responsible for connecting the external carotid system with the internal and responsible for most of the distal and more uh, freaking complications, which is blindness and uh, cerebellar ischemia. But other than that, we can now Continue with the venous system. Remember that, if we can zoom out, okay. Normally, the venous and arteries will go together on all the trajectory. But especially with the um, facial vein, that does not happen because it will have a more posterior and lateral trajectory, and then it will continue caudal. Down, we can, okay, straight toward the carotid, the carotid vein. Up here, you will normally see a branch of the vein, which is an intercantal, and this is what normally bruises during uh, putting some fillers on the bridge of the nose. So that's the vein and that's the artery systems, and this is the first level of knowledge that you need. And now I'm going to go to the temporal area and to locate the continuance of the external carotid. It's very easy to push the tissue towards the auricle, and you will have a crease. And this crease is where, if we go like this, there you see the crease. And this crease will delimit and marks the emergence of the superior temporal artery. Then it will cross not more than one centimeter in front of the auricle, and it will go on top of the zygoma bone, and will start going medially about one, two, three, four millimeters, uh, centimeters above the zygoma. It will continue like this. It will make the frontal branch and then the parietal branch. 
and this will be the superior temporal artery and its branches. And yes, of course, there are some cases that these branches connect with the supraorbital branches, and we might have another source of continuance between the external carotid and the internal carotid. <laughs> Having said this, this is just the first level of security. You have to know the position, the location of your vessels. But the second level that we have, thankfully, is deafness. We need to know how deep these vessels are so we can avoid them. So, to start again in the glabella, the emergence of the supratrochlear is deep from the bone. It continues under um, the gallia, that means the undersurface of the muscles, both the corrugator and the frontal. And 1.5 centimeters above its emergence, around here, it will perforate the frontal muscle and it will continue superficial to it. So here we have then deep in most of the cases and superficial after that. Contrary to this, most of the trajectory of the facial artery is deep, like Dr. Castemont has said, it goes under the muscles. And in the temporal area, it goes under the superficial fascia. So most of it is superficial. So to recoup, here we have deep. Here in the temporal, we have superficial. And here in the glabella and forehead, we have a mixed. Theoretically, it's safe to go strictly with the cannula under the, uh, the dermis to put some filler. Here, it will have to be deep over supraperiosteum. Here, we have options either with a cannula to be in the subcutaneous fat, better ways also to do on the superficial fat temporal compartment. And most of us, if you can zoom out exactly, most of us put it inside the muscle because it's an avascular plane around this area. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the other side to inject, so now we go, and we're gonna inject here the mid face, the mid face. There is a very nice way to do this that is safe and reliable, and that's why I'm painting, normally I wouldn't do, but I take into consideration bone uh, referrals and landmarks, not the iris or the pupil, and this will compensate immediately for differences between ethnicities, especially in Asia. So I palpate the infraorbital notch, then I draw a line that indicates more or less the emergence of the infraorbital nerve, the inner table of the orbit and the outside table of the orbit, then the upper limit will be the orbicular reticular ligament, and the lower one will be the end of the maxilla. And this will give me one, two, three, four areas to treat. I normally don't treat number one because it doesn't need to be treated because the nasolabial fat compartment stays there. And the vessels are here. So try not to use number one. I don't use number four because it's too lateral, if you can see. So the projection will be lateral. And we need anterior projection of the mid face. So that's how we're going to do it. And now, techniques. You can use cannula or you can use needle, like Dr. Castemont said. Depends on how much product I need. If I'm going to treat just one point, it's a needle. If I'm going to treat an area, I will use a cannula. In this case, I'm using the cannula of a precision cannula soft field, 25, 25 gauge. And as a product, I'm going to use Matrifill, which is a CE mark a Chinese product with a high G prime and a middle product integration, which will be very good for her. So Frank, I think this is a good opportunity just to thank the, all the industries that supported this uh, session, especially by scientific uh, to uh, Matrifil, who provided the scientific gra uh, grant, grant, grant for this uh, session. Matrifil is a, a Chinese uh, filler which actually got a C mark recently. 
Exactly. <laughs> and we've uh, used this product for a couple of years. It has a safe safety record that is recommendable. And now I push some volume, some tissue into the mid-phase to see exactly what curvature, convexity do I get. And this is the area that needs most of the treatment. So now we are going to initiate the treatment and we're going to lay down the patient a little bit. So just if you can show us the product and meanwhile I just want to draw the attention of the audience to the redness on the patient's face. It can be <laughs> due to her rosacea or a topical anesthetic or alcohol used to treat the patient. But I think it's very important because in our management of potential complications, the color changes are very important. So we have to be very, uh, to, to, to put, a, to, to, to note the color before the injection. Because if something changes, it's a very important sign for us. Okay, so the redness is before the treatment. Thank you, Marina. I can tell you that the redness is due to topical anesthesia that we put her on like 25 minutes before. Now, where do I put the entry point? It's another safety for vascular. Because I don't go here because we have that zygomatic frontal branch uh, artery. And then I try to go directly to the place where it's responsible for most of the volume loss, which is the deep fat compartments, precisely in the infraorbital um, and uh, canine fossa. The infraorbital fossa and canine fossa. I will do that by going straight forward close to the bone, and then turning my cannula over to the area. I hope this can be seen. It's very important with your needle, it's very important with your needle to show the deafness and the direction. You cannot do the, the direction with a cannula once it's done with a needle. So very softly, very softly, under the maxilla, but straight into the deep compartments, we do the injection. Like that. And we can see on the cadaver, actually, Dr. Castamo is exposing the undercutaneous tissues. Yeah, we shouldn't have the any vascularity here. Mm -hmm. It's just very local. And we come in. And then I go deep into the bone. There, I'm in the bone, I'm in the bone. And softly, I will turn around to arrive not only to the deep cheek malar fat pad, but to the soof, because that's where I need to be. How do I know I'm deep? I cannot see my cannula. If you can zoom out a little bit, please. If you can zoom out a little bit. So now, it's almost painless. We can start applying the product. And how much product to apply depends. I use the same convexity of the malar prominence to get a good result of convexity from lateral to medial. I don't put my hands on it. I don't push until I see that I'm exactly in the area that I marked, and I get the convexity that I need. So I'm going to put <coughs> around 0 0.5 of matrifil. Yeah, matrifil has a very high G prime, yeah. so you need a lot, uh, not a lot of product. Not a lot. But yes. Frank, I just wanted to ask you, the cannula that you are using has a red dot that actually showing the extrusion site. Does it make any different it does difference? Not. It does not at this deafness. It does okay. not. But it's good to know anyway. And it also has some marks to see how much of the cannula is inside the tissue. So now we have provided some convexity here that we will have to see on the side compared to the other. It's just 0 0.7. And if I want more sharpness or definition, I will apply more product to the malar prominence, but probably that can be done either with cannula or with a needle. 
And this is very safe because the plane is pretty uh, vascular. We are very, very deep, and the projection will be always anterior. You just injected above the bone, is that right? It's exactly on the deep cheek fat compartment. So it's above the bone. Deep cheek fat, fat compartment. compartment. And over here, if you can see where my, I'm pointing, this is, this is the SUF. So I also use the SUF orbicularis oculi fat as a receptacle for my product. This is the natural way to do it. This is a the compartments that lose more volume during aging. That's why when you put the product, it will turn into a natural convexity. You don't have to provide it. It comes natural. <laughs> 